welcome to the uh, welcome to the Transit Coalition dinner meeting. The Transit Coalition is a nonprofit that deals with land use planning, goods movement, transportation advocacy, and educational programs. This is one of our educational programs where we get different speakers each month to come and talk about uh, topics. Tonight is Colin from the office of OEI. <laughs> and I have to think about innovation and extraordinary innovations. <laughs> and I actually met him in the war room years ago in 2007 or 8. We were with um, one of the organizations. We did this thing for the transportation bill. Every week we had a war room meeting. So it was a long time ago. That was fun. <laughs> one of those where you were working for Senator, was it Senator? Senator Carper, yeah. Senator Carper. And so he's had a long and varied career on the East Coast. And then I think when Josh moved here, they must have been friends and got recruited to It was entirely merit-based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your kids play together. That's the idea. Right? But anyways, um, we do have these Transit Coalition dinner meetings. Uh, next month we have the Streetcar Project. Derek Fennick Dick is here. And he's going to be presenting on the Los Angeles Streetcar Project, which, because Derek is visionary, instead of just being a, a one-route, 3.7-mile streetcar, he visualizes it to be a much bigger system, which is interesting, because my grandfather, way back in the 20s, there was like hundreds of miles of streetcar, and he used to build streets for the streetcar in, streetcar in South Park, Los Angeles. Anyways, the Transit Coalition, we're grateful that we have a number of sponsors. And we'll mention tonight, and some of our sponsors are going to say a word. We've got Rail Passengers Association, and then um, Brian's going to talk about that for a second. Um, Build Your Dreams and Sky Rail. Uh, Tom Stone is here, he's going to talk for 20 seconds. Uh, Destination Enterprises is not here. Marcy is one of our grateful sponsors, we're grateful for her. And then HDR and Tom Kim is not here. So we're going to start with. Um, Brian will talk for about a minute on the Rail Passengers Association of California. Hi, I'm Brian Yannity. I'm with the Rail Passengers Association of California and Nevada, but our acronym, popularly known as Rail Pack. And we've been around 40 years and we just advocate for better transit service, a rail transit service from light rail to streetcar, but inner city and Amtrak is a big focus of ours, along with high speed rail. And we do this quarterly magazine, Steel Wheels, in a coalition with several other groups um, across the Western United States. And we have three copies here. It's the current issue and the back issue. And please grab a copy. And we have worked with the uh, Transit Coalition for many years as well. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Build Your Dreams. Uh, Tom is here. And Hi, I'm Tom one. Stone. I'm a senior strategic advisor to BYD on its SkyRail program with accent on the word senior. Um, and uh, I'm uh, helping with the proposal to actually to call in an insult team for the Sepulveda Pass project. Um, BYD, for those of you who don't know, although they're based in Shenzhen, China, actually has never been and is not Chinese government owned or controlled. Um, and it is uh, active in six continents, about $20 billion a year in revenues, growing from uh, electric uh, rechargeable battery manufacturers starting in 1995. About 250,000 employees and uh, a big plant up in Lancaster uh, turning out uh, more than by America compliant battery electric buses with a workforce of about 800 employees in cooperation with the Jobs to Move America and the Smart Union. About 85% of those employees are minorities and women, so they're doing a great job. Uh, BYD's turned out 50,000 battery electric buses globally and uh, now turning their attention to two, pro two uh, technologies you'll be hearing more about, uh, SkyRail and SkyShell. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for sponsoring. Thank you, and we appreciate your sponsorship. Um, so right now we're going to do introductions in the room so Colin can know who's here. So we'll start off. I think we introduced everybody. There'll be a few latecomers, but we're ready to roll. So. Um, if you want to give a short biography before what I mentioned, um, yeah, sure. but um, otherwise, you know, some family connection that got here in Metro. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. And Colin's going to talk to you about private, well, public-private partnerships. 
so welcome. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation and uh, to, 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 to be able to hang out with such a diverse and, and thoughtful group for, for the evening. So thank you for, for having me. Um, so yeah, so I've been here at Metro for about four years, um, working in the Office of Extraordinary Innovation um, with all of the baggage that that comes with in terms of just generally being mocked on a regular basis for having such an ostent ostentatious uh, department name. Um, <laughs> I initially started uh, launch, uh, standing up our unsolicited proposal policy, building a lot of the policy guidance around that, and um, figuring out how we were going to process, uh, uh, um, evaluate, and move forward unsolicited proposals uh, in, in an agency that's you know very very focused and committed to you know the broad suite of competitive solicitations that we tend to issue. So. Um, a lot of culture change and a lot of uh, uh, you know trying to break some new ground and keep a lot of interesting uh, interests happy around the around the agency while also fostering a real pipeline of innovation. And we've had well over 200 proposals come in, and with about 10 to 15 percent of those being <coughs> implemented in some way, shape, or form. So crowdsourcing innovation is always a challenge, but we find that it's absolutely worth it in terms of bringing all sorts of ideas to Metro about both different things that we can do that we otherwise wouldn't, or doing things differently in terms of things that we are planning to do, how we can do them differently. And that's really where P3s come in, which is um, after the unsolicited proposal policy really started to uh, roll with its own inertia, um, I really was able to take over uh, just focusing on developing Metro's public-private partnership program. A number of unsolicited proposals, including many from, or a few from people in this room, uh, for how Metro could deliver its mega projects in a way that might offer more value than traditional delivery methods. And um, as part of evaluating those, we got to the point when we said, we want to move some of these forward. Well, we had a public-private partnerships program in the planning department, maybe wasn't the right place for it. There were some challenges associated with, you know, kind of how you move forward from a business case to something else. So. OEI, the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, was going to take over that role of trying to move some of these projects forward into the implementation role. Um, why am I qualified for this at all is a question I ask myself a lot. Um, but really what it goes back to, just in terms of my, my background, before I was um, at Metro, I was a policy guy. I worked in DC for a long time and Boston before that at a range of different jobs focusing on how to solve policy problems. And really, when you're look, looking at government, when you're looking at lobbying, when you're looking at advocacy, when you're looking at coalition building, when you're looking at, 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 at policy decision making, it is all about how to bring together a whole bunch of moving parts to all move together. And that really, it, for, for me, over the past few years, there's a lot of knowledge that I've had to gain in terms of just learning about some of the first principles of P3s, which is a lot of what I want to talk about tonight. But um, Figuring out how to bring those parts together to have a, a, a whole that's greater than the sum is what that was all about. And so um, critical thinking, uh, uh, bringing together various information streams that might not be naturally complementary and trying to merge them into some sort of synthesis that can give you insights into how to make something more successful, I think, is a lot of what I've done throughout my career, which has mainly been focused on the intersection of climate change and transportation, how to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas impacts of the transportation sector, mainly through interventions in the built environment. And so, uh, before this, I was on Capitol Hill for five years working for Senator Tom Carper, who's now the ranking member of the Environment and Public Works Committee in charge of uh, um, our na nation's surface transport, federal surface transportation policy, um, and then worked for a number of different NGOs that were advocating or advising on various climate friendly transportation policies for about a uh, decade before that. So. So here I am, and have this uh, um, interesting new, new, new challenge of moving uh, P3s forward at Metro. And to me, uh, what I want to talk about tonight is some of the things that I've learned that I think a lot of people maybe either underappreciate or don't fully, uh, don't fully appreciate when it comes to what exactly it is about P3s that drive value. How do you actually attract value from a P3? And I feel like it's a real challenge because there's some huge misconceptions around that. So. I know there's a bunch of really sophisticated people in the audience um, that probably know all this stuff and can probably teach me a thing or two about it, probably more than a thing or two about it, and um, so I'm, I'll trust that you'll uh, gently point out if you disagree with me or think that I'm wrong on any of these things, but 
I've tried to break it down into where I think P3s drive value because that's how we can best pull all of these dis disparate uh, elements together to make for a successful project and a project that's going to be more successful, more innovative, more efficient, more effective, perform better than some other default delivery model, which is for Metro typically design build, which is a very respectable delivery model. There's nothing against it. But like anything, no single delivery model is right for all projects. We should always be asking what's the best way to deliver this project, not let's deliver this as a design build because that's what we do, that's how we've done it, that's what we should do. So <clears throat> I'll just start out just in general with the, and it looks like they have taken, Metro's got this funky bespoke font called Scala. And when, you, and, when, and, when, and, when you, and when it's not loaded into the PowerPoint program, it converts it to this weird, like, like computerized, like teletype thing. So I promise you, this there's going to be weird formatting in here, and I didn't design it that way. I actually try and pay a lot of attention to design details. So I apologize. That really kind of breaks my heart. Um, um, the first thing I want to do is just talk about how we define a P3, because there's lots of different types of partnerships, and OEI is actually in charge of engagement with the private sector across a range of different uh, uh, partnership models, but all of Metro is constantly partnering with the private sector on all sorts of contracts. So a question that I've asked a lot of folks and getting a lot of interesting answers is, these are four different Metro initiatives of our express lanes, design, build, operate, maintain, our CNG bus fueling uh, uh, projects, um, our advertising contract with Intersection and Outfront Media, and our contracted bus services. Are all of these P3s? Are any of these P3s? Does anybody, uh, does anybody have any feelings about what they would call a P3? Top left, definitely. Top left, definitely. Okay, anybody else? Bottom left, definitely. Bottom left, definitely. All of them. All of them, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think that you could make the case that all of them might be, but the way that we've tried to define P3s, there's a specific element of the CNG bus fueling uh, that I really think actually drives a lot of the value. And this is when we look at Canada, when we look at the UK, when we look at Australia, we have a lot of ex experience in these type of project finance initiatives, and that is the finance. The finance actually turns out to be an incredibly meaningful part of a P3 that really actually anchors the partnership in more than just a handshake. It anchors it in true skin in the game, in true investment in the same outcomes of performance that the owner cares about. And that alignment of incentives, I think, is really critical. So I think that there are, you can define it any number of different ways, but for our purposes, the fact that this, the, the provider of the CNG bus fueling apparatus also is invested in uh, in, invested in the capital cost and has a performance-based payment that is at risk depending on the uptime of the actual facility, that's what we think of as a public-private partnership. Um, it, yes, it's a collaboration between a public agency and a private company to deliver public service or facility where you're sharing skills and, and, and you're managing risks and allocating them according to who's best positioned to manage them. But that finance piece is what I think is really important, and I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit. I do think it's important to just make sure that we're noting what a P3 can and can't do. Um, it absolutely can leverage the private sector skills that we don't necessarily always have internally. Um, private sector uh, companies are always evolving, always changing, always bringing on new people, always taking risks, always trying new things, and we can leverage that when we partner effectively. Um, sharing those risks and rewards of a project is really important and I think that one of the big challenges is people think about risk in kind of interesting ways when it comes to capital project delivery. Sometimes I get the feeling that people think that risk is kind of just the cost of doing business. Bad things happen on big complicated projects and you, you manage the best you can. Sometimes things cost more than you hope they did and that's maybe, but risks are actually things that can be predicted things that, that can be quantified, things that can be discreetly described and actually allocated commercially in a contract to one party or another with an expected value, and then can be mitigated to reduce that value and manage to try and avoid that, 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 that impact happening. And especially when people's paychecks are at risk, <coughs> at-risk capital, the, the ability to do that it can actually really help to reduce the risk pro profile of a project in addition to just managing it. Finally, the incentives towards innovation and long-term performance are something that I think are absolutely critical in P3. 
uh, simply because there is so much more pressure to really make sure that it performs, again, because of that at-risk capital function. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that and some of the weeds of that in just a bit. What does it not do? It's not a new source of revenue. So many people send the bank, I don't understand why, the, you know, at Los Angeles, great. Why doesn't the private sector want to come and invest in our system? Because they're not charities. <laughs> they're not giving out free money because they want to see trains happen. They're investors in a product and they expect to get a reasonable rate of return. Yes, they can bring up front money, but yes, that needs to be paid back. It absolutely doesn't change ownership of the assets. A lot of people tend to think that it's privatization, that it's, 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 we're somehow losing control. We're losing control of public policy, public interest. Absolutely does not, uh, is not the case. Um, and it doesn't necessarily suit all projects. There are a lot of projects that P3 is absolutely wrong for. Um, the question that I really want to dive into a little bit more is why use a public-private partnership? Because that's what we really had to ask ourselves and look in the mirror every single day and say, is this, are we, are we using this tool correctly? Um, so we talk about that private sector expertise and innovation and rigor, um, but we also talk about certainty and risk and performance, which are really key. We, you know, a lot of times we talk about just building the asset and all the intended risks of that, and you have to own it. Owning an asset can cost two, three times as much as the cost of building it over its entire lifespan. If you build a project for $5 billion, it might cost you, cost you 15 to own it. We focus all of our efforts on the build and nothing on the actual making sure that the, 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 the operations and maintenance are performing appropriately. So that's a really critical piece of it. And then there's that whole of life cost consideration. There is a total cost of ownership to build something, to operate and maintain it for its useful life, and then to either recapitalize it or decommission it if it's not useful anymore. And again, we really are focusing, I think, a little bit too much on the upfront and not the tail end of, which can be a pretty fat tail. <clears throat> There's a few principles that I just think are important to, uh, to, to be explicit about because these are things that we are try, we try to stay true to. First of all, you can't outsource public policy. You always have to do what's in the best interest of the people you're trying to serve, which is the, 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 the public of, uh, of LA County. Um, second of all, Value for money must be clear. You have to have a financial case for why you're doing a P3, not just because it's cool or innovative or whatever. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we actually try to assess that later on. Uh, it's got to be fair and transparent. Um, you know, this is this is you know, in terms of public communication, in terms of the NEPA process, it shouldn't look any different to the public. And again, public ownership and control. A few misconceptions, I don't know if anybody was at Metro's board meeting today, but there were some misconceptions out there uh, that I think that you know some of these things address. We're not privatizing public resources. We retain ownership and control. We define what the performance is supposed to look like. We hold the private sector accountable for delivering on that. Um, it doesn't lead to public sector job losses. These are, these are, you know, we're not privatizing our employees and firing people. That's absolutely not the, 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 the approach here. And P3s can and should uh, be governed by, by, by collective bargaining agreements. If there's, if there's unionizations, which there often, often is, um, P3 workforces are around the world are unionized, and it's part of the quality workforce that helps to deliver on that performance. Um, doesn't take a backseat to private sector profits. I don't care whether it's design, bid, build, design, build, P3, you name it. Nobody's doing it for free. Private sector expects to make a profit, and that is reasonable. This is the system that we live in. So, uh, you know, that, that's a that's a that's a, a factor here. That doesn't mean that public service takes a back seat to it, and it certainly doesn't exclude small and local contractors. There are as many, if not more, opportunities for SBEs and DBEs to work on P3s as there are in any other project. It's still construction. It's still operations. It's still maintenance. It's still civil works. So some misconceptions I think are important to clear up. Uh, Metro does have a history of looking through different procurement models and trying to um, make determinations around which ones are the best. Uh, the regional connector was a design build. As I noted, the express lanes was a design build, operate, maintain, no finance involved, but they did package the operations and maintenance with the, uh, the construction of the express lanes facility. The gold line was actually uh, thought, uh, thought about as a DBF for a minute. Um, mainly as a way to gap finance, uh, except uh, they, they ended up delivering it as, as a design build, but it was something that was considered. So these are all just tools in the toolbox, and as we move forward, when we bring in design build, operate, or design build finance, operate, design build finance, operate, maintain, those types of things, 
We're just trying to broaden the toolbox and say, there's a lot of ways to deliver a project, which one is the right one? The benefits that we're trying to achieve, it's really important always to know what you're trying to achieve by utilizing a different delivery model. Absolutely, you know, we're focused on fast, faster project delivery timeframes, but we also need to acknowledge that those things are constrained by how much construction and civil work can be done in a given period of time. It's not, you know, you, you, it's, 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 it's not magic. <laughs> Ultimately, building stuff does take time. Um, I think that the ability to stack different work streams on top of each other or to do things more concurrently uh, and certainly to, to use innovative means and methods can allow for that, but it's a goal, but it needs to be reasonably caveated. Um, create, uh, creativity and technology access. Uh, certainly there are things that we might not be willing to try that given the appropriate risk allocation, a private company said, you know, we will take the risk on this because we're pretty sure we can make it work. Metro may not be able to hire the right people to, make, to, to, to manage those types of things based on you know, our own HR challenges. Um, the private sector maybe can, so access to new technologies, new approaches. Um, it, while it doesn't create new funding, it can create more flexible access to financing. We have a constrained debt policy. We have uh, you know, a lot of projects that we're trying to finance. Bond finance is not always necessarily the most efficient given the risks of a project. So, that's something that we can actually uh, look at in terms of financial flexibility. And then there's potential, <coughs> excuse me, for cost savings. Um, you can minimize, uh, certainly, scheduling cost overruns through transfer of certain risks. And there are incentives for cost savings over the life of, life of a project. There are some risks and costs that can be shifted to private partner. You're going to pay for that, and the question is, can they accomplish the same thing more efficiently than you otherwise would, reducing the cost to both? And then project performance, which I'll keep coming back to. Performance and accountability is absolutely central to a P3 in a way that it's a little bit harder to get at in a design build or certain other types of delivery models. So when I look at this, when I think about the levers that I have to pull to make projects <clears> successful, there's really, with P3s, three things that I think about as being at the top of the list and the most important for how they deliver value. First of all, integrated project scope. What do I mean by that? taking various scope elements of the life cycle of a project and integrating them such that you, there can be overall design or operational efficiencies. And the analogy that I always use is how many people have said to themselves, if whoever designed this house had to live here, they would have done it totally differently because some stupid thing bugs you, some cabinet's in the way, some... Having to actually take ownership over your design decisions to use it day in and day out and to use it effectively makes you rethink exactly how you're going to design it. The best designers in the world, really, if they're not actually going to assume the ownership of it, are they're going to make different decisions. It's not about quality, it's just about incentives. Um, so, you know, similarly with operations, if you have to operate something, you might design, you might spec something higher than you otherwise would because you know that it's going to reduce your operations costs later you might actually spec something lower than you otherwise would and not be able to <coughs> something because you know that you'll have the right people there that can sweat that asset and know exactly when it needs to be switched out to make sure that you're not impacting performance and keeping costs as low as possible. Those are the types of trade-offs that if you break the scope apart, it's a lot harder to accomplish. Performance-based contracting, performance requirements instead of technical specifications. I need you to move this many people from here to there with this type of travel time as opposed to it needs to be a four-car train with this many seats running at this speed. You know, instead of being prescriptive about telling people how to do something, tell them what you want to do and let them figure out the best way to do it given their skills and their capabilities. That can allow for a whole bunch of innovation and flexibility that technical inputs ne can't necessarily do. And then finally, I keep coming back to this capital at risk. When you're putting your own skin in the game and whether you get it back with a return depends on your performance that is going to create a lot of rigor, a lot of due diligence, and a lot of incentive to get it right. And I go through this argument with a lot of my mentor colleagues when they say, there's nothing magic that the private sector can do that we can't. We can do everything they can do. And I said, great, I believe you. Let's bet your paycheck on it. And they always turn me down. So I think that that, that, that financial risk is something that is absolutely key. Um, <clears throat> So we talk about the integrated project scope, um, and I'm just going to try and go through th some of these things quickly because with the, you know, we're looking at the different types of, of scope elements that we have the opportunity to integrate with some of our big capital projects, and really it comes down to 
the design and engineering, the final design and construction, construction period financing, uh, the systems operation and maintenance in the long term state of good repair. And there's just, to a certain level you can remix some of these and so the question that we ask is what are the, what are the, where is the opportunity for innovation in terms of scope integration? Uh, you know, is there value in, 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 in pulling some of these out and keeping them for ourselves or giving them to the private sector? So that's a big question that we have to answer, but that's the, the concept of in integrated project scope. And you can see that when you start to look at the contract structures of how these deals are delivered. And this is, a, you know, these are charts that a lot of people have seen, but I really think they're illustrative where when Metro does a design build, we have a design builder that, that, that completes all of this. And then they deliver the project to Metro, and Metro has its own operations uh, workforce that self-performs. And Metro has its own maintenance workforce, and sometimes they work together, but maybe not really. And Metro has its uh, own state of good repair requirements that if we can track it appropriately, we hire re rehabilitation and recapitalization contractors to come and fix it if we have the money. And all of those are different things that we have to manage, and maybe we do a good job. And maybe we don't go do a good job, but let me tell you this, it's a really hard job. It's a really hard job with constrained resources, constrained people. Um, uh, it's something that is, uh, you know, and I hear it again from Metro colleagues often. The operations folks say, if our construction group only had to, if they had to operate what they built, they would do it entirely differently. And the maintenance folks say, I can't believe they designed it this way. This makes it impossible to maintain. The state of repair folks said, well, some, if they're even around, they say, um, uh, uh, you know, the operations folks should have replaced this three weeks ago. Why, why didn't they do that? Now it's impacting performance and it's going to cost me three times as much to fix. So all of these things are being financed with cash and sales tax bond proceeds that is coming into Metro. Now the people that hold those bonds, they actually really don't care whether we deliver the projects or not. We could actually just build a big model train system and they're going to get paid back. They're going to get their proceeds. So the fact that the financing is actually completely separate from how things work, whether things work, I think is a meaningful difference. Contrast that with a P3 contract structure where this is what some people uh, affectionately refer to as one throat to choke, where when something goes wrong, you come to one person, which is the P3 developer, the contract, the, the central contractor. They're the one that's managing the design builder. They're the one that, they, and they oftentimes are actually one and the same. They're the ones that are not managing an O&M provider. They're the ones that are raising all the finance for the project over here. And as a matter of fact, the finance, because their capital is at risk, has a big incentive to have to make sure that the O&M provider is doing things right and the construction is going to go right and recheck in all those numbers a hundred different times to make sure that they're going to get their expected return on their investment. And they act very they act very differently than a passive bondholder might. So we still get that money, but because it's being run through that, it's an extra level of rigor and diligence that might not otherwise occur. And that helps to create this integrated team down here that basically brings value to that integrated integrated scope that I talked about to, to make it something that can actually be leveraged to drive those operational efficiencies or design efficiencies or maintenance efficiencies. So this is what we're trying to achieve when we talk about integrated scope and how that contract structure is going to bring value to Metro. The next thing I want to talk about, we talked about performance-based contracting. Tell me what you want, not how you want me to do it. Let me figure out how best to do it. And then hold me accountable for it. And that last piece is really, really important. So this is actually just a kind of generic look at what a, uh, how, how a P3 developer is typically paid in what's called an availability contract, where it's being paid for performance. They're not taking risk on toll revenues or anything like that, expecting that people they are going to get paid that way. The agency is going to pay them milestone payments during construction, even if the cost of actual construction is higher, because they're going to remember, remember the P3 is going to finance some of that, and they're going to get paid back for this finance out here. And so part of that, this is the capital repayment in light blue up here, and then there's an operating cost payment, and that's what makes up your availability payment. Now, the, the key thing about this, it's a monthly payment, it's, it's structured, it's regular, is that it's subject to performance. It's subject to performance deductions. And that drives some really interesting behaviors, because whether you get repaid for the in money that you invested in the capital, whether you get repaid for that out here is dependent on how well you're operating, maintaining, delivering on your promises. So just 
from a, let's just take the, take the first thing. I talk about schedule certainty. These are those little monthly availability payments I said. Revenue service begins on time, you get in your full suite of availability payments. If you do it <coughs> late, well, your Fed's first schedule availability payment, you're not getting that. That can be several hundred million dollars. Now, oftentimes there's ways to, to make that back up. I mean, you don't want to be punitive. So these are some exaggerated examples to illustrate points. But the point is that there's a real financial incentive. It's not just liquidated damages. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it is you're missing your first payment um, to, to, to get things done on time. Um, we talk about the value of that capital at risk, and uh, it, these things kind of work together. So um, I'm going to come back to that, that payment for performance concept in just a second. Really, it's the same total capital cost. Instead of uh, um, you know four hundred that million dollars, this is a billion dollar project. Four hundred million dollars in metro cash and grant funds, and six hundred million dollars of sales tax bond proceeds. We're going to say four hundred million, the same four hundred million dollars in metro cash, then five hundred and fifty million dollars of private debt proceeds from the P three firm, and then they're going to invest fifty million dollars of their own money, and that's their 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 equity, their actual personal investment or, or corporate investment in the project, and so. It's really you know, the same structure, and this actually might end up being a little bit more expensive, and we'll talk about value for money in a second. But ultimately, you're getting to the same thing just with a different financial structure, and that, that becomes important when you look at how performance deductions get levied. So what we have here is three different scenarios. And this, again, is that monthly availability payment. Here's the operating portion, here's the capital portion. This is how the developer, the P3 developer, is going to be using these funds. You've got your operations and maintenance costs. So what does it cost to run the line? What do they have to put in a reserve account or use on maintenance for kind of your overall life cycle or state of good repair? Right? And that's kind of your operating portion. And that should be about equivalent. There's the debt service from the capital from construction and the equity dividends, which is the reasonable return on investment for the equity investors. And that matches the capital portion. Performance is satisfactory what Metro is paying, what the P3 developer is spending their money on, including profits and things like that, they're about the same. Everybody's happy. What happens if there's a cost overrun? What if O&M costs are higher than expected? Well, we've agreed to it. You've, you've given us this bid. Unless there's some sort of a um, extenuating circumstance, which is listed out in the contract, called, it's called a supervening event, um, that would give you relief from that. If your costs are higher than expected for some reason that is not Metro's responsibility, then that's going to push everything up. But Metro is still paying the same amount. So what happens? Well, first of all, there's no equity dividend, so somebody's not making a profit. Second of all, you can't fully repay your debt service. So remember those private lenders that are in the background, they're coming in and saying, wait a second, you're screwed up and I'm not getting paid? This isn't going to work. I'm going to exert some of my rights to lean on you, the operator, or you, the P3 developer, and say, you need to fix this. You need to figure out how to make this right. Same thing if performance is poor. In this case, what we have is the O&M costs are as expected, the life cycle costs are expected. What's happening here is that we're making a performance deduction because stations were you know, uh, uh, unavailable. They were shut down, or they're not meeting their minimum uh, run times, or whatever it is. Some performance uh, um, standard that we agreed to is not being met. So in this case, we're going to bring down what we're paying. And again, it's starting to in, eat into the financial incentive of the P3 developer. And so you can see how that capital at risk starts to really incentivize a whole bunch of new behaviors to prevent cost overruns, to prevent poor performance, to make sure that we're allocating the, the, you know, the funding right for this, to make sure that we are doing what we can to make sure that the project is performing as expected. So it's a really powerful tool, the idea of scope integration, payment for performance, and capital at risk that can drive some really interesting behaviors. The question is, this is all theoretical. It all sounds good on paper, right? How do you know that it's going to work? Well, you have to do your homework. You have to actually dive in and do the math and figure out what this looks like. And we have a very specific way of doing that called building a P3 business case. And what that looks at is what is the best value delivery model. So it's very different from the benefit cost analysis where you're saying, what should we build? Once you've determined what you are going to build, you say, what's the best use of the public dollars that we have to build this? How do I get the most value out of every dollar I spend? And it's useful not just for making that decision, but also to support this commercial structuring to drive all those incentives I talked about, 
to allocate risk and va evaluate the risk appropriately, to figure out who should have it and what it's worth, to figure out what your procurement strategy is so you can actually figure out how to use competitive tension of the procurement process to drive towards your goals and objectives, um, to assess your proposals, to figure out if they're what they are, if they're, if they're worthwhile relative to certain benchmarks, to administer your contract, and to manage your project. So the business case is actually this fundamental building block of analysis that can really help you to uh, think through a project a lot more effectively, a lot more critically, to get better outcomes. And that forces the owner to do more due diligence up front in a way that I think is also very meaningful. Critical components of a business a business case, market sounding, interaction with the private sector, just saying, what do you think? Here's a bunch of questions. Do you think that we should do this or we should do that? Give us feedback. You've seen more projects than, I, than we have. You have a completely different perspective. You're going to be our counterparty. How should we do this? Qualitative assessment. Looking, Just looking at things and thinking through all the attendant risks and opportunities and efficiencies. What are we trying to achieve? What's most likely to help us achieve that? Um, and then a quantitative financial assessment, which I think is very valuable but sometimes gets too much focus, which includes a risk analysis, comparative financial modeling, sensitivity analysis, and affordability assessment, which I'll get into just very briefly in a little bit. And then you pull that all together and say, given everything we know from what we've heard from the private sector, from what we know to be true based on qualitative factors that can't necessarily be quantified, from our quantitative analysis, what do we think is the best way to deliver this project? And it gives you all sorts of insights into project delivery that helps you pick the best value delivery model, but also just helps you know more about your project so you can support a successful delivery. So this is kind of our general step in terms of how we develop a business case, uh, um, starting with project screening and selection, which projects do we want to run a business case on? It's fairly time and, and, and financially intensive, so we want to be selective about that. We talk about the qualitative project assessment. Based on some of those things, we could create some assumptions, go out to the market, talk to them about it. At that point, we need to develop project cost reports so we can start to really quantitatively analyze things and start to look at all the key project risks and quantify those. Then we build a big probability model and run that 10,000 times to figure out what the most likely outcomes are at different confidence levels and do this, this, this uh, analysis that looks at what is the increment of, of risk that can be likely retained and does that exceed any of the increased potential costs of a P3, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Move over to say, okay, now how does that align with what funding we have? Do we need to make adjustments based on affordability? Um, all of that comes together to say, this is how we're going to recommend we actually deliver this project. Um, we develop the final project performance uh, specifications based on that, and that's what establishes your, uh, your, your procurement package in terms of going forward. So, uh, there's a lot of information here, and I'll make the we'll make the slides available. But this is essentially the process that we go through, and there are some inc important precursors. Where, for example, you don't want to rec recommend a best value procurement strategy before you define your project through a locally preferred alternative. So there are some key milestones in terms of how fast this can move relative to the project development process overall. So value for money analysis, a lot is made of it. It's, it, it's a helpful tool, it's not the be all end all. It certainly doesn't, you know, you don't push a button and get a, you know, yes do a P3 or no don't do a P3 out of it. But essentially what you're doing is creating a financial model of delivering the project via a, a traditional approach and delivering the project during, with, with, with a P3 approach and saying, what's different between the two? And you make some assumptions, basically you're saying the scope is the same, the capital cost there is the same, we're not gonna assume any efficiencies there. The operating and maintenance costs are the same. Long-term stay of good repair costs might be different if we can justify that technically, but generally it's the same project. But let's look at the risks associated with this and the value of those risks. Let's analyze those and understand what the likelihood of a risk occurring is under different delivery models, what the cost impact of that risk would be under different delivery models, and then who that risk would impact under different delivery models. Is it something that impacts Metro? or something that can be transferred to a private partner and how, how would they manage it. And the value of that retained risk for Metro really is the differentiating factor that we're looking for because that means that at the end of the day, when all of the challenges have materialized and all the things have gone wrong, what actually is the impact to Metro and what is the act, what can be managed better by the private sector. And value for money would really be the difference in the net present cost discounted back to the present day or, or construction start between the two delivery models. And it ends up looking something like this, where basically this is a net present cost of all of the project's life cycle costs from construction all the way through rehabilitation and repair 
and you start out and you say, in the typical design build approach, again, capital costs are the same, O&M costs are the same, but private lending and equity dividends are going to cost you extra. There are additional costs with that private finance. But then you do this risk analysis and you look at all the risks that are likely to materialize into the different models and you allocate those. And once you do that analysis and come back, again, your design costs are the same, your O&M costs are the same, but all of a sudden you've got this construction risk that you're going to retain and this O&M risk that you're going to retain. And these are costs that are likely to happen. They have a likelihood. They may not be very likely to happen. They might be very likely to happen, but there is a likelihood of them happening. And when this exceeds the increased value of private, uh, private finance, that's when you're saying that you have value for money. And you're looking to drive that value for money through how you structure your contract. So it's a really interesting and helpful tool to help you get more insights into your project, what the key challenges are, but also to support a successful P3 procurement and even determine if you should do it in the first place. Um, if you do, uh, have you know a performance-based contract, an integrated scope that allows you to actually have some design innovation or operating innovation, and you do end up getting lower design build costs or lower operating costs, your value for money is only going to increase. But you don't want to assume those things. It's like you know walking into a car dealership and assuming you're going to be able to you know talk the guy down five thousand dollars when you only have you know when you don't have have the money if you, if you don't get the rebate. Um, so we try not to assume those things. We try and look at those and say that they're... So for the model on the right side, yeah. the private sector is actually taking an operating system. Yeah. Um, so it's not really the private sector is actually taking an operating system. For how many years will the private sector operate the same? The terms are going are to differ depending on the project um, and depending on the owner's needs. In certain cases, uh, generally you want to have it coincide with some multiple of the lifespan of one of your larger components. So oftentimes in, in, in rail projects, it's somewhere around 30 or 35 years because a rail vehicle has a, you're doing a midlife overhaul at about 15 years, and you pretty much need to replace that car at around 30 years. So you don't want to have issues where you the, the, the private sector needs to fully replace something halfway through the, you know, obviously smaller, smaller uh, uh, um, capital uh, components, sure. Um, but Sydney Metro is experimenting with a much shorter operational term. And then that's, that's actually in, in particular because they want the ability to potentially replace those rail cars to keep up with technology innovations. Um, uh, you can, you know, that, that CNG fuel pump deal that I talked about, I think that was seven years because they would assume that the, they would basically have, you know, need to replace that fuel pump after seven years. Um, so it really has to do with the, the, the residual asset value in determining the term, but also the owner's affordability. Sometimes you need to, you know, sometimes you can get a 24-month lease, sometimes you need to get a 36-month lease to afford the car, right? So. Is there, is there a financial model where the private sector fails to operate on the same system and the owner has to take that back? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so those are called step-in rights, and you, that's a bad day for everybody, and you don't want to have to happen, have it happen, but it really is kind of the axe hanging over everybody's head. So essentially, if you've got a severe case of non-performance, the, the private sector is in default. Now, there's a series of steps leading up to it whereby, first, uh, you know, there's cure periods where they can fix, fix things. Then there's um, step-in rights where the lenders are actually able to step in and replace the O&M contractor if that's where the lack of performance is happening. If it's, your, and this is an oversimplification, if you're still having issues, then the agency can actually step in either for a period of time or terminate the contract entirely. And all, you know, again, those are, this is what you want to try and avoid, but it's, because it's a bad day for everybody, including the owner, it's not, it's not a good scenario. But these types of consequential situations are also what helps drive behaviors towards people try, you know, trying to avoid those types of scenarios by doing everything they can to ensure performance, but also not signing up the deals that they can't deliver on. Um, this is just some historical context in terms of where capital uh, uh, savings have happened compared to owner's estimates. Obviously, estimation of large, large civil works projects is hard. This is just to say that capital savings can and do happen, um, uh, you know, whether they end up materializing or not through changes and all of that is a different question. But, and then this is, actually looks at the operating profile, uh, or operating expense profile of um, two different projects uh, 
basically saying this is you know how a public owner tends to pay its operating costs with these little state of good repair, these light blue, with some you know replacements of major systems. And this is like a mid-year rail car overhaul. This is a rail car replacement. What you would see oftentimes in um, private sector scenarios is what's called um, a, less, you know, a smoother and less lumpy uh, uh, operations and maintenance profile where they're doing ongoing maintenance, um, including replacing components more uh, as they need to be replaced rather than just big tranches of planned timed replacement. And this is exaggerated for to make, to make a point, but it's just to say that there are lots of ways to run a railroad and if you give people flexibility, they can find those efficiencies in ways that can be meaningful. Um, so all of that is uh, kind of how we think about public private partnerships, what we're trying to get out of these things, how we're thinking about project structuring. Um, I find all this stuff fascinating, so hopefully it's been interesting. I know people are really interested in projects. What's the project? So I do have three last slides on what the projects that we're looking at are, why we're looking at them, and then we can have some discussion, it looks like, for uh, about half an hour, so I'll, I'll wrap up pretty quickly. Um, so let's pull it up. This is in procurement right now, so I can't talk about it too much beyond what's already publicly available, but you know, we have planned to deliver the project as a design build. Um, you know, there was managed lanes that were going uh, through the Sepulveda Pass, and we were going to build a new rail line um, uh, between the Orange Line BRT and the Purple Line or the Expo Line. Um, $9.8 billion in total capital uh, availability based on some 2015 back in the envelope elements. Um, $5.7 billion uh, for the, the initial transit element in, in Section B there, and these are the old. Um, uh, diagrams, so probably no longer valid with some of the transportation, fe the transit feasibility study work that's been done. Um, some some general parameters around groundbreakings. We got several <coughs> unsolicited proposals <coughs> indicating that there were a lot of ways that we could do this, and that there were significant risks involved in any of them. Um, and we really needed to look at those things and figure out ways to first of all design the project to be as efficient as possible, to minimize risk, and then also structure a P3 delivery to actually try to manage that risk most appropriately. But what was really interesting about all the proposals that we got is there was a um, <clears throat> pretty significant uh, 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 unanimity in every proposal saying, this is gonna require a collaborative design. This co corridor is complicated. This corridor has unique characteristics. This corridor is something that if you make certain assumptions without <clears throat> consulting construction experts and operating experts, if you just try and plan this with proxy consultants as proxies, with all due respect to all the consultants in the room, <laughs> you might make mistakes. And those mistakes might be expensive. And they might be impossible to unmake. So you should actually go through a collaborative design process called a, a preliminary development agreement where contractors are brought in much earlier. And the insights of a contractor are really Put to, bit, put to use in trying to understand how best to balance affordability, project performance, constructability, which is obviously a key driver of risk, and the risk profile of the overall projects through operations and maintenance, et cetera. There are all sorts of things that need to be balanced to make this project work. And we need, we decided we needed teams of, 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 of super smart people in lots of different disciplines working together to figure out this multivariable equation and come up with what's hopefully a pretty optimized answer. So um, uh, this this will be probably one of the more unique projects, uh, project delivery approaches um, uh, that that we can find in recent memory in the U.S. Um, uh, you know, we're all uh, uh, really eager to see how the process wraps up and, and, and start start working on this because um, we really think we can extract a lot of value in this collaborative design and scope validation process, trying to identify key challenges early and perhaps avoid them, design around them, or figure out better ways to manage them. So um, exciting exciting project that's moving forward. Hopefully we have some uh, some, some good announcements this summer uh, regarding moving forward with some P3 contractors. And, I'm sorry, PDA contractors presuming a P3 delivery. And um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be questions on that. Um, oh, that's I guess I already spoke, spoke to all this, sorry. West, West Santa Ana Branch is another very complicated uh, corridor, but constrained in very different ways. There's actually, unlike Sepulveda, where there's a whole bunch of design solutions that have all sorts of different implications that need to be balanced, this is a much more constrained corridor that has very defined 
challenges. And one of the big ones is overall affordability. And so figuring out how to package this work together and manage the risk in, 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 in ways uh, through, through maybe multiple contracts, uh, that seems to be something that could bring a lot of value. And that's what our analysis of our various unsolicited proposals showed. It also showed that we really needed to focus on giving private sector innovation to work around certain challenges in creative ways. So we're, we're actually focused on um, uh, really making our design efforts leading up to um, the RFP process uh, very risk-based. So generally when we design a project, we'll take it up to a certain design level and kind of hand that package to the DB bidders and say, you know, take this and develop it into a project that you can price and build. Here we're going to really try and actually focus des our design efforts on our biggest cost and schedule drivers. So all of our utilities trying to figure out everything that needs to be done with, with them. Everything where the California Public Utilities Commission is going to have to issue a permit for a grade crossing. Any kind of interface with our freight rail uh, um, uh, corridor uh, that, that runs along here. Caltrans, the Army Corps of Engineers, trying to design around those things. So ultimately what we have is as clean of a corridor as possible and then say, now that we've figured out all these high risk areas, we would like to actually provide very little in terms of baseline design for the actual civil works and things like that. Give a clean corridor to a P3 developer and say, we have no views on vehicle technology, we have no views on propulsion approach, we have no views on any of these things. What we're interested in is, is, is in this corridor that we have cleared for you and dealt with all the sticky issues, a project that can meet these performance outcomes. Bring us your innovative ideas. Help us figure out how we can work, work through some of these things within our affordability caps. So very different approach where we're trying to drive innovation using these levers that I talked about, but in a very different way, uh, you know, um, by focusing on trying to create the puzzle to solve rather than inviting our partners into the tent to help us solve the puzzle. Um, the final one uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, over the last uh, year or so, the East San Fernando, Fernando Valley, Valley Transit Corridor, street running LRT up Van Nuys Boulevard, very well defined scope, nearing environmental clearance, a lot of technical complexity um, that has the potential for independent operations. There's some good characteristics qualitatively that might make you think it's a good P3. We're currently going through that business case development process and we should have some information for the public soon about what the results of that are, um, but uh, just a, a third project that we're currently evaluating. We are also, we've gotten unsolicited proposals for delivery of our um, uh, uh, battery electric bus network that we need to develop out, including all the attendant charging infrastructure. We, we uh, just today uh, uh, passed into, uh, the, the board approved a contract for our on-demand microtransit pilot project, which actually does have a lot of features, even though there's not a big upfront capital cost of this, the notion of performance-based contracting. We actually created kind of a synthetic capital at risk structure through a bonus structure. Um, a few other things that we're trying to use these P3 principles to drive performance in an operational context, but also allow for innovation. Um, a few other uh, projects that we're, that we're always uh, kind of looking at um, from a P3 standpoint, but hopefully this gives you some insight into the projects we're looking at, why we're looking at them, and more importantly, how we're looking at them, how we're trying to use some of these key value drivers to create opportunities for innovation that can drive towards the public policy goals that we all care about, I'm sure you all care about, certainly any taxpayer in LA cares about, and actually uh, deliver the best project for the public's money as early as possible and make sure that it's going to perform throughout its intended life cycle because ultimately that's what, what, that's what we're here for is to provide that public service in a high quality way. So happy to take, I know that's a lot of stuff, happy to take any questions, flip back to slides, whatever you need. We got. I need your question in the back. Does the East Valley Rapid Transit corridor have to be street running? Because you can make a lot of my constituents happy if it wasn't great separated. Um, the environmental process uh, that we ran through determined that it was a going to be a street running option with no grade separations. Uh, so, look, man, the bottom line is when you make it aerial, you somewhere between two and five times the cost. So it comes down to what can you afford, right? Um, I think that's, that's, always, that's, that's always the challenge, but the environmental process took into consideration a lot of public feedback and the locally preferred alternative that the Metro Board approved was a street running LRT. What's that? If there had been an offer for grade separated LRT, that would have probably been more popular. <clears throat> uh, thank you.
what will be the process <clears throat> of bringing on new teams for the Sepulveda Pass? And how, uh, what's the process of bringing on small businesses into that sure. aspect? So the Sepulveda Project is, we've structured it in, in, in what we think is a way that um, is pretty creative. First of all, uh, we're asking contractor teams to come on early to help us co-create the design. Uh, we've divided that process up into five phases that are discrete packages of work uh, focused on key activities and bookended by key milestones. Those milestones, um, uh, those work packages, excuse me, each have a SPE goal associated with them. But this is, you know, essentially a services contract. We're designing something. We're doing, you know, investigations out in the field. We're, we're putting together what this project is. So each of those phases have SPE goals associated with them. And when we're taking proposals right now, the only people that we say need to be at the table are a construction contractor, uh, an equity provider, and an engineering firm. They, th that, that group of people can bring on as few or as many firms during the proposal phase as they want, knowing that they're going to need to figure out a way to incorporate those firms to do that work and meet those goals uh, and hopefully exceed those goals throughout the course of the project. That's for design. Once we get to the end of that, then we have an implementation phase where it's being constructed. That will look like any design build project in terms of there'll be an establishment of goals for each of those, and there'll be lots of opportunities for all sorts of small businesses to come and be part of that. So in terms of SBE participation, it really shouldn't look any different than you would typically see on a metro services contract or a metro construction contract. We've established those goals as we always would and uh, we'll do so in the future. So, um, you know, all of the teams are required to host uh, um, SPE outreach events, and um, I believe they all have, um, and, uh, you know, we'll continue to host our SPE outreach events to make sure that we're connecting primes with subs. But, um, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the process, uh, and it really hews to what Metro's general process is. Now I'm wearing my BizFed hat, just wearing it as a transit geek hat. Uh, there was one slide in particular that was really interesting, that sort of comparison of different projects. Oh, go back, go back oh. one. No, go back some more. Oh, wait. There we go, that one. Oh, this one. Nope, this one. nope, this that one. one. Are all those projects predominantly uh, like on the surface of a little bit of aerial? Because I think most of them, there's not much tunnel to them off to. The ones you have listed historically in the U.S. And the reason I bring that up, uh, what was that? Presidio's a tunnel. Presidio's a tunnel. Okay, that's yeah. didn't know that. That's I was curious about it because because if you're trying to manage risk, usually the more you go in a tunnel, that's the more that can pop up and expose yeah. that risk. I mean, and uh, I was curious uh, with the over the pass in West Santa sure. Ana, there's a good amount of tunneling involved. What what uh, what do you expect? Or actually, can't even say that because <laughs> you're in a, that blackout period. I can tell you this, tunnels are very risky, and they're a very unique kind of risk, and figuring out how to define, how to allocate and manage that risk definitely is, can be a key value driver, but it can also keep a bunch of risk on the owner. So it is a big factor in determining value for money. Um, there are plenty of tunnel projects, and a good example of one is the Port of Miami Tunnel. <laughs> um, that, that was a P3, that were, uh, um, that was a P3 that actually did also show cost savings. This is not value for money. This is capital cost savings. Okay. Um, value for money is a different question, and it's important that we differentiate uh, cost efficiencies or cost savings through, you know, broader performance-based contracts and innovation from value for money because they're two different things. But Port of Miami Tunnel uh, showed some significant capital cost savings. But again, capital cost savings is not the core reason in my mind to do P3s. Uh, looking at delivery risk is really what's driving this. If you can manage to get this through through innovation, through performance-based contracting, that is an added benefit. Okay. So going back one slide. That one. Yeah. <coughs> right. Highly simplified. <laughs> yeah, you did a great presentation of summarizing what P3 is and how to compare that with design build and how to use the P3 to the right way. So I was looking at this, and it's kind of my first time looking at it in a bar chart like that. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, so it, maybe this is just a wild question. That, yeah, sure. You know, I'm actually going to move back to the one that doesn't assume any capital or operational yeah, cost savings. You say graphs are not scaled, so yeah, some may be more or less. But basically, 
you know, design, build versus design, build, finance, operate, maintain, right? Yep. On, on the right side, uh, if you do it right, there's a cost saving for the owner, right? Uh, after all risks are accounted for. After yes. all risks are accounted for. So, on the owner side, design, build is pretty much equal with the P3 side, the, the, right? For the design, build part. Before. We well you you make that so this is an assumption for, right. for when we do value for money uh -huh. we just assume that, that there is that the capital costs are identical. Uh -huh. So then, where's the construction risk and operate maintain risk on the uh, on the private financier? So they this is really focusing on the, the owner's retained risk. Again, this is this is simplified. If uh -huh. yes, there absolutely is a. Uh, a value associated with the risk once it's transferred, and I didn't it didn't show it here because I, I I simplified it for the purposes of just kind of pointing out that the owner's retained risk is oftentimes where the big differentiator is. But yes, you're absolutely right that so it's rolled in. It it, it sh I mean technically it should be represented not just in the in the in the cost of private finance, but you could say it's somewhere in here. Um, you could actually show some bars to it. When we do, a, when we, do, I mean, if you were looking at an actual value for money uh, um, NPC chart, it would it would absolutely show the cost of the expected cost of the risk that is bought, borne by the 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 P three concessionaire. But generally speaking, that it's rolled into design build and rolled into the O M cost. Um, if you can account, you can account for it a lot of different ways. Right. But it, you can you can. You can roll it into, you know, you could, you could put it as a sliver on top of this, you could put it, you know, you can right. account for a lot of different ways. And then the second question is that this is all present value. Yes, okay? yes. So, like, assuming design, build, finance, operate, maintain, P3 is 20, 30, 40, 50 years or whatever, then your equity dividends and your private lending, I mean, is, is, is that really that much compared to construction and design, build, just general rule of thumb? Shouldn't it be a lot more because of the the time it takes to pay? Mm, most of the most of what I've seen, you know, the, the this is this is the additional cost. I mean, this is the the like the return on. It. Yes, so you're going to be financing a lot more of this, but this is your like your um, uh, essentially the the incremental cost of debt service or something like that. The equity dividends is not repayment of equity. Oh. It's it's the dividend they're getting on top of that. It's the rate of return, right? It's the it's the interest. It's the it's that right, right. so. Well, you, you but, still have the, the interest through time. That you got yeah, absolutely. And if you looked at a, a, at a at a cash flow profile, yeah, yeah. you would you would see substantial uh, um, capital repayment happening. And so the the principal portion of the capital repayment is large, you know. But the you know we borrow, for example, at about three and a half four percent in the bond market, you know. If you are, especially if you're buying down your the cost of capital with things like private activity bonds and TIFIA, you can get your weighted average cost of private debt five and a half, six percent. I don't know, Will, am I in the ballpark? It's and not then, that much different. A lot of projects that have been done in the last few years have been pretty, pretty close in financing costs. It's a lot of money to see lines out there. So, like six percent is in 12 years, you've got to double that. So, but that's the whole idea of the yeah. value of money is that uh -huh. in the future. It's worth potentially more, or it's worth a lot less in the future than it's worth now. Right. So, so that the, 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 the current game. current value is going to go up really high. Right? No, the current it's going to get paid throughout time, which costs more to get paid in the future. It's, it's but that's the whole concept okay. behind value of money is you bring it back to what's worth less now. A dollar is worth risk. more to me today than it is to me tomorrow. Right. Right. right? So you got to discount that all out, and when I. You know, if, if it's, you know. If you borrow a dollar at 6% in 12 years, you got to pay back $2, basically. Yes, but that, having that $2 today is worth more than, to me, than, it, than having that $6 yeah. in the future. <laughs> so I was just curious, you know, is it really that much? Is it a lot more on the finance? But, that, okay. This is, pretty, this is, this is, this is close-ish yeah. to scale. <laughs> and, then, and then the risk itself. Yeah. How do you take into account future that you don't know. Uh, I mean, you, you look at data sets, you look at your own experience, you look at, you know, results on other projects, you benchmark. So, from um, past experience. And, and, and data from other projects. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we have, you, 
you know, I've got a colleague right now who is literally going through change logs for all of Metro's past capital projects and figuring out what's, what have been the major cost drivers. And, you know, we start out with a baselining exercise where we bring all the subject matter experts together in a room in a risk workshop and say, what do you think the likelihood of this happening is? What do you think the cost impact of that happening is? And then we look at the data and say, are they generally on point or are they, and then we bring it to them and they say, actually, we look back at these change logs for these past three projects and it looks like this happens a lot. Are you sure it's only a 10% risk or is it more like a 50% risk? Yeah. And the cost impact is generally on, you know, the base cost of whatever it's impacting, you know, a lot different than what you said. Yeah. Well, maybe it is a little bit different. So, I mean, look, everything is only as good as the assumptions you right. make. And one of the things that I kind of said, I, I've said a few times uh, to, to in other groups is, risk analysis is a much better mirror than it is a window. It gives you a look at really who you are and how you perform as an owner, mm -hmm. much more than it gives you a window into what performance is, is or should be, right? It, it forces you to confront how well, how well you actually manage your projects and yeah. where you really struggle and where you really do well. And that is a really valuable exercise in terms of figuring out, maybe we should have somebody that could do this better actually take yeah. this responsibility. So, so, you know, to figure out the owner based on past performance, really doesn't tell you what's gonna happen in the future and there's a huge risk to that. It's quite interesting how these financiers figure it out and say P3 yes. is gonna pencil out and it's gonna work for us. It's 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 it's, it's it's saying it's not saying that it's going to pencil out and it's gonna work for us. It's saying that this is a model that sh that if you if you buy into the assumptions and it's important to go through them and be transparent about them, that this is a this is a this is a likely future, right? This is all about probability. But I guess I would challenge you to come up with a better approach, right? Because the better approach that I've seen is people saying bad things are going to happen and we'll deal with them as best we can when they do. And that seems to be less good than this, <laughs> to my mind. But I, I like data, I like analysis. Um, I also think it's really important not to make a decision about P3 or not P3 based on comparative financial modeling. I think it's a, a good, insight into the project, but I think that the risk analysis itself can tell you as much as the NPC evaluations can. I think that the qualitative assessment is incredibly important. I think that what the market is telling you is incredibly important. All of these things need to build up to your overall insights in the project. This is one component of that, and if you're looking at this and making your decisions solely based on what your uh, 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 VFM says, you better be real, real sure about your assumptions. Okay. Yeah, so that, 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 well, so you can do the, a couple different ways. You can do it pre-mitigation, which is generally how we're looking at it, or you can do it post-mitigation. So what, when we look at this, we're actually trying to identify what do we actually think that we can mitigate well, and how can we bring down the, 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 the expected cost of those risks, and what do we think that the private sector can mitigate better than we can so they can bring down. So your, your, your relative NPVs are going to be similar, but you're, you're trying to bring down the overall cost of the risk on both sides of the ledger um, through that efficient allocation based on best position to manage. Um, you could get yourself into a world of different kind of scenario do loops if you said, well, let's put it back and see what happens and let's go over here and you can do a lot of that. It just gets really expensive and again, because it is fraught with a lot of assumptions and it's important to be, you know, to recognize that it's only as good as your assumptions this is, this is, again, it's, it's a tool to help give you insights into where you can probably get value. And then how to structure your procurement, right? So again, so with the West Santa Ana Branch project, we're finding out that, you know, there is a ton of retained owner's risk in certain key design interface areas with third parties. So we're making decisions about trying to pull some of those things out and deliver them through different work packages under separate cover and then moving towards um, saying, okay, for the remainder of this project, affordability is gonna be a challenge. So what we need to do is first of all, design to less of a level, second of all, give a pure performance spec, and third of all, make sure our procurement process has a, a, enough time and enough of a stipend 
to give teams opportunities to really try and work through different approaches to try and optimize the actual design of the civil works, the systems, the propulsion, the vehicles, those types of things. So it helps give you insights into how you can use competitive tension to drive value and where there are things that are going to just be sticking points that maybe you should either not assume value in or try and deal with in some other way. So what is our, our two projects so a lot of it's being driven by the environmental process. We're doing all this while the project is being defined and permitted through the environmental process. Current assumption is, I believe, April 21 RFQ. Okay, thank you. You have the slide with the five projects on there. Uh, yeah, the... Uh, oh, this one, sorry. The one with the yeah. five. So what's, I mean, this is a great slide to, a marketing slide to sell P3, right? Because you're, even though this is the gravy on top, the capital cost savings. So on the, I guess on the engineer's estimate side, what's the variance on that number from the actual to, you know, because if the engineer's estimate was low, yeah. then well, that would decrease. And if it was and high, you'd show a much more favorable capital cost savings. So these are, these are, these are savings between uh, um, com comparing bid, final bid price, accepted bid price, and owner's estimate. There's a third data point, right, which is the outcome cost. What did it actually cost at the end of the day? <laughs> and um, uh, this, this doesn't show that. So that, that would be a different graph, and I don't know what that graph would say. Um, I'm assuming that these would change, and you know. <laughs> um, that's why it's dangerous to assume, to assume these types of cost savings. Um, I, I also think it's important, you know, what I wish somebody would do is actually put together a huge data set of, you know, uh, uh, engineer's estimates at various points in project development, uh, final independent cost estimate to support procurement, uh, final awarded bid price, and then outturn cost, and like run a bunch of regressions against a bunch of other factors to understand like what's driving the biggest variance in those things, but I don't think that's, uh, that's been, been done yet. If you don't have good grass games, <laughs> I'd be really interested in that. So, Carl, I think so some discussions about the, the cost of the project yeah, and, sure. and the cost of the project with, when you have operations and maintenance, I worked on both design build and the P3 procurement side. When you go to P3, you don't, I mean, you may have a higher construction cost, but you're trying to minimize your operations maintenance, but that's the, the big chunk of the cost. Yeah. So that's where the, the owner sees the benefit because you, Use Operations and maintenance, and, and in particular, life cycle and state of good repair costs, exactly. I think that's so actually think, so an even bigger opportunity. So that's why the, I mean, think of those charts, the design build cost might go up for P3 uh, when you have the O&M side of it. Versus the other. I know you're trying to make a, a general statement. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, San Fernando, just curious on the timing. Is that, if it goes P3, is it before or after West Savannah? Uh, the um, the timing of the procurement will be relatively the same whether it is or is not P3 and the current expectation is that the procurement would be released before the end of the year but I am not close enough to the project team to know if they are, how certain they are in that. The record of decision for the NEPA work has been delayed again and again and again and that's been pushing everything out and I, I don't know what, what the issues are there. We were doing, asked to do an analysis on the actual project costs and that we, what we came back with was, you know, regardless, we're still, we're still looking at P3 versus DB, but what we did find is that there are a ton of third party uh, uh, risks in the quarter that are going to be retained by Metro no matter what, and managing those is probably the biggest priority no matter what the delivery model is. Thank you. In this context, how are we defining first principles, and is that something that was established by Metro, or is that, what does that mean? Uh, when I say first principles, I'm talking, I'm going to go way, way, way back. Um, first principles in terms of, you know, what I think are the actual value drivers of P3. First principles are, you know, what what is it that you're actually gaining by utilizing a P3, how does that work, and how can you turn dials like that? So maybe first principles is the wrong, the wrong word because we talked about some of our principles of like you know don't outsource public policy and stuff like that. This is really kind of the fundamental value drivers. Maybe is a better way of putting it. I've heard it in this context before. The same 
yeah. first principle. Those no, I, I mean these are these are things that when I look back at the literature and the experience of agencies that have used those, this is how value. You know, I, it's a simple, it's an oversimplified and slightly dramatized story. But you know, the you know project finance was kind of invented for the Panama Canal, right? And then uh, it was utilized as a financing mechanism in developing countries that didn't have credit and and open, mm -hmm. you know the kind of financial markets that developed countries have to, to, to invest in infrastructure. And then the British were like, hey, we can use this to offload a bunch of long-term liabilities from public balance sheets and make it look like we're far healthier than we are under John Major and uh, a few others. And then the Canadians were like, but wait, your long-term O&M and state of good repair costs are going way down and you're actually getting all sorts of innovations. We're gonna you know, turn this into an interesting you know, approach and, 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 and call it, call it public-private partnerships and invent this value for money model for in assessing it. And you know, that's kind of in, you know, a very kind of glib uh, 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 approach to the story. But you know, I think what we're trying to do is say, what if people learn what, that they've gotten value out of this project delivery model, this project finance approach? I mean, a lot of these principles are actually super common in real estate development. And when I actually real estate developers get this way quicker than than like engineers do. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, because they're all about leverage and they're all about trying you know trying to drive those those types of outcomes on their builders and things like that. Um, but the uh, uh, what I'm talking about is really just. How do you get value, and can you figure out how to disaggregate that and utilize it in different ways to maximize it, to, to try and connect your approach to delivery with your objectives and goals of the project? That's that's what I'm thinking about, not just you know go do a P3. What do I have to do? I have to get my advisors. I have to develop a product. You know, it's like why, what? Think critically. I'm trying to think critically about it to understand you know what it is, how it is we're accomplishing what we want to accomplish. I have a question about the unsolicited proposals. Mm -hmm. um, what is the process for doing that? If I got a bunch of partners together and we had a P3 idea on <laughs> some project, whether it's in the planning queue or not. So um, <clears throat> it's a two-step process. Um, we accept unsolicited proposals from you know pretty much anything, and we'll evaluate them according to this two-step process. The first step is conceptual. It's really meant to be an opportunity for you to identify to, uh, to Metro what you think is a value proposition. So here's the thing you're not doing that you should do. Here's something you are doing that you should do differently. Um, help us understand the conceptual value in the approach that you are suggesting. We pull together an internal team of subject matter experts or those that might be impacted by the implementation of the idea and get their perspectives. Is there a kernel of value here? Is there a nugget of an idea that is worth developing and exploring more? If the answer is yes, then we'll go back out and say we'd like more detail from you, and we'd like enough detail that we can actually do, a, do, a, do sufficient analysis to determine whether we actually want to do this or not. That breaks down into a four-step process. The first step is actually defining that value proposition. What specifically is it that we saw in that conceptual proposal that we want to test the value of? Developing an evaluation methodology to actually test that value proposition, defining a data set that's needed to run that evaluation methodology, and then ultimately running it and doing the analysis and producing some findings. And so we try not to ask for any more information than we think we need to come to a determination that we want to move forward or not, but sometimes it can be substantial. So. There's an interactive process where, you know, we can absolutely give you feedback and ideas, or we can, um, you know, uh, answer all sorts of clarifications. But it's an opportunity to to help create uh, um, either new transaction opportunities or steer transaction opportunities in a way that could be beneficial both for the private sector and for Metro and our stakeholders in a way that is a win for everybody. It's definitely it, it can definitely be time and resource intensive. It certainly is for us. Um, it's not for everybody, but it is the kind of thing where some people have found value. And like I said today, um, a $40 million contract for a you know, pretty novel on-demand uh, transit service uh, was launched based on an unsolicited proposal that was submitted two years ago. So um, it can absolutely yield big things. So is your office the official recipient of such proposals? Yes. Okay. So what makes this extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> and those always turn into procurements, though. 
Yeah, I mean, ultimately, <coughs> both federal and state law are pretty clear that we need to do a, a competitive solicitation. And so, like I said, it's not for everybody. But again, some firms have found that it, it create, it's an opportunity to create transaction opportunities that would not have happened. So they wouldn't even have an opportunity to compete for it. Um, and second of all, I mean, you're not defining, you know, we're still defining the scope of work, but it's based on your ideas. You should be relatively well positioned for it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, what would be the process of getting what, like, the RFP, like, getting for to, like, you have a request for proposals for, like, the Sepulveda Pass? Mm -hmm. It's on our, our, our vendor portal. So um, you have to log in, create a vendor portal, go through that whole process. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if thank you, but that's the process. <laughs> <laughs> I agree that our in, that our IT tech is not always uh, at the leading edge of user friendliness. So, the, uh, for the process you just mentioned about the uh, the uh, unsolicited uh, proposals, is that uh, sorry, is that is that a document on the web? Yeah, if you just uh, again on the vendor portal or even on, our, on the OEI section of the Metro website, you can find the RM solicit proposal policy that lays out the process. There is actually a separate process for joint development uh, of, re of, of uh, um, real estate parcels. So sometimes that confuses people because their process is much more specific and defined. Mm -hmm. But uh, it lays a lot of these things out. Okay, thank you. I think you have a figure uh, in one of those slides for all the past about nine. Yeah, I gotta I admit, I put this together today real quickly while I was doing about 17 other things, so I might have made pulled an old slide that's out of date. So uh, all of this is um, the the, the 9.8 billion dollars. First of all, it's not total capital costs; it's actually a budget allocation, and that's for things like actually 9.7 is the measure of allocation for the entire quarter. Right. So the, the question the question is given. Discussions today's dollars versus tomorrow's dollars, inflation, and the inevitable, you know, process of building a mega monster project like this. There's going to be a delta of what actually going to cost by the time it gets ready for construction. So our measure M dollar, our measure M expenditure plan is all in um, uh, uh, base year 2015 dollars. And there is a reasonable expectation, expectation of, ex, of inflation in the financial model that supports the measure and expenditure plan. How inflation is calculated is actually technically up to the board and verified by our taxpayer oversight committee. Um, but if, um, when it comes time to establish a life project budget, that the, 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 infl the inflationary impacts of time compared to the 2015 base are accounted for in the allocation of life project budget, including including the contribution of the private sector through a, a P three uh, additional. It's just it's funds. just assessing the capital cost of the project. Mm -hmm. So the contribution yeah. of P three is is immaterial. How many today for Metro? What's the kind of scope of how many P threes you have in? in we have two that we're actively developing. Yeah. Procurement one 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 in procurement mm -hmm. one that we are actively and and you know very uh, uh, committed to developing a procurement on with the West Santa Ana branch yep. and about four more that we're assessing at various stages that I it's I just it's hard to say How about active that have been approved to move forward. Sepulveda is the only one that's been approved to move okay. forward for a procurement. We have not delivered any project as a P three. Denver Eagle of Maryland Purple Line and now uh, uh, APM, the, the Puma Mover at Lava are the only three fixed skyway transit P3s in the U.S. Really? There are a lot in Canada. There are a lot around the world. Mm -hmm. Open Airport APM. I'm sorry? Open Airport APM. Wasn't that a D-bomb? Yes. I don't think there's Three. any private. Yeah, if, you, if you go by the definition that private finance is required to have a true P3, then no, otherwise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good answer. <laughs> How? How closely, if at all, are you watching the P3 process as it applies to the LAX people who the project? Extremely closely. We have had a ton of meetings with the LAWA team, all of their advisors. We hired a bunch of their advisors. 
Uh, we have lessons learned sessions um, uh, ongoing on an ongoing basis as we see that project unfold. And you know we've uh, you know we have a huge matrix of uh, uh, um, you know various um, commercial approaches to P3s that we use as a benchmark for when we're, when we're making policy decisions about how we want to deliver things. So we've analyzed their project agreement pretty carefully. Then so. maybe time for one more, if anybody has any other questions. We all want to? Yeah, I heard a rumor that the <laughs> largest, the, the variance on, on people who uh, LAX is the O and M. I do not have any insights into <laughs> what may or may not have occurred in the selection of that project other than what's been publicly disclosed. <laughs> Came from DC, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to mention that there will be a PowerPoint that will be sent out. We have all your email addresses. There also will be a video you can watch again and share. And our next meeting is on the. 17th or 19th of uh, March on the streetcar. So thank you very much for attending and have a great weekend. When will that PowerPoint be